May I wish you all a, a warm welcome and a, a good morning from Wheelock Heath Baptist Church. We welcome all those who have gathered here uh, this morning and uh, for those who may well be, be with us for the first time. Good to have you here. Those who are here, all nicely socially distanced and, uh, and, and masked, uh, and, uh, and we also welcome those who are with us on live streaming. We welcome you in God's name. I'm Peter Butler, part of the leadership serving the church that meets here. A year ago, I'm told that we met freely without any restrictions whatsoever. And uh, our thoughts were that, oh, this will last for a week or two, and then we'll be back to normal. Well, here we are, 12 months on. And uh, it's not quite as we would have it be, but God's been good to us and he's preserved us, and here we are, a worshipping and a gathered people this morning. We give thanks to God for that. Let's read from God's word, uh, from the prophecy of Isaiah, to be found in the Old Testament, the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And we'll begin to read from the first verse. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor a ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sigh will flee away. What a great and wonderful picture we have there from the prophecy of Isaiah, from the word of God. In my youth, following a very minor sporting achievement, the great Newcastle Evening Chronicle uh, published a photograph of me. And in my youthful vanity, that hasn't passed greatly, but there it was, I bought a newspaper and went through the newspaper to find this picture of myself in all my great glory. But I couldn't find it. And so I went through it again. And there was a picture there, a picture of me, but I didn't recognize myself. Uh, and fortunately, not many other people did either. <laughs> Isaiah writes here about a people, and he describes them as them, and they, and those, in verses 2, 8, 10, uh, 
but the question is, who is he writing about? Well, didn't you recognize yourself when we were reading those verses together? Yes, it becomes clear towards the end of the passage in verse 9. He's speaking of those the Lord has rescued, those the Lord has ransomed. In other words, those he has chosen, those he has saved. And if your faith and trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he's talking about you and he's talking about me. So let's recognize ourselves. So what does Isaiah say about us? Verse 1, he reminds us that whatever our circumstances appear to be, we can be confident we will have the Lord's abundant provision. But it will take the eye of faith to see this. Verse 2, the presence and the glory of the Lord will always be with us and we will be able to recognize this by faith. And then as we go into verses 3 and 4, we see here, yes, our circumstances, our road may be inexplicably uh, fraught with twists and with turns, but it is a pathway that is under the protection of the living God. No hazard is going to stop our Christian journey. Verse 8 tells us, it's a highway of holiness that runs from the day of our conversion all the way to glory, all the way to our ultimate destination. And then lastly, our destination is guaranteed. Verse 10, and those the Lord rescued will return. Everything that made our Christian journey a sad and an anxious experience will be ended. Sorrow, sighing will be replaced by joy and by gladness. You see, heaven doesn't allow the entrance of any disappointment. So what more then could we ever wish for in this picture of the Lord's people? We see here a protected path, an assured arrival, a safe homecoming, and an unbroken eternal happiness. What promises and what glorious prospect for the people of God. And once we were blind to all of these things, which are all now revealed to us, to the opened eyes of faith. And let these things this morning fill our vision. May we see them, and may these things prompt our worship and our, our praise. We're going to turn to our opening hymn this morning, and it's still a great pity that we can't stand to sing with our voices, but we can sing with our hearts. And it's this hymn, O Father, You Are Sovereign. In all the worlds you made, your mighty word was spoken, and light and life obeyed. Your voice commands the seasons and bounds the ocean's shore, sets stars within their courses, and stills the tempest's roar. This is our God. This is our Father. This is the one in whom we place our trust. Let's stand uh, as this is sung and we sing this in our hearts.
Now let's come before our God in prayer. Let's all pray together. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will indeed open our eyes to the truth that you are the sovereign God over all things, both in heaven and in earth. There is nothing beyond your knowledge. There is nothing that extends beyond your power. You are truly God. You are truly ruler over all things that you have made. You are the one worthy of all worship, for you are the mighty one. How we praise you, praise you this morning that we do not cower in your presence, fearful of daring ever to approach you. But we recognize that it is you who comes to us as a loving and a caring Heavenly Father who has loved us with an everlasting love. We approach you reverently and confidently, knowing you to be an infinitely holy God, totally intolerant of our sin and our rebellion to your rule over our lives. Instead of your acceptance, we deserve your rejection. Instead of forgiveness, we stand condemned, deserving eternal punishment and not eternal bliss. How we praise you that there is a way back to you, our God, from our dark paths of sin, the door that is open for us to enter in, to know your cleansing, your pardon, you're welcome, and never to be held at arm's length, but to be accepted into your family by the glorious provision of adoption, becoming nothing less than the blood-bought children of you, the living God. Oh, what mercy. Oh, what grace. We thank you for the enormity of the cost of our redemption and reconciliation, the price that we could never pay. You could not have given more than you did in giving and sending your own dear son to this fallen world. One who set aside his majesty, his status, his privileges, his rights to stoop to our humanity, to become a servant, a slave, to be ridiculed and rejected, and yet for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. We thank you that he took the punishment that was rightly ours. He paid the price of our redemption and set us gloriously free. What a substitution. What atonement. It leaves us humbled in your presence and broken in the face of your mercy and of your love. And at the same time, we are related in finding in Jesus our only hope in meeting our deepest need. We thank you, Lord, that in this life we have not simply been left to our own questionable devices, but we have the assurance of your provision for us at each step of the way along this road of pilgrimage to glory. We confess that our sight is often dim. We fail to recognize and avail ourselves of your faithful and gracious provision. And although our hearts are often cold and our fears stronger than our faith, we thank you that you are always with us to guide us, to direct us, and indeed comfort and with that grand assurance of promise that you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. There are many times we confess that we are perplexed, perplexed at your providence. We don't always understand the way you are taking us. Nevertheless, may our obedience never be thwarted by our lack of understanding. Help us to trust you, 
You, the God who knows where you are taking us. Always for our learning. Always for our Christian maturity and our eventual good. Enable us, we pray, to walk on that highway of holiness where the redeemed of the Lord will walk and do walk. And although we encounter inexplicable twists and turns along the way, you know the way that we take. And we are eternally secure under your loving direction and the glad anticipation of that glorious destination. So lead the way and grant us grace to obediently follow. May the prospect of dwelling in the house of the Lord forever and the consummation of our salvation, may these things thrill our hearts as we move through what often appears to be this veil of tears. Open our blind eyes, we pray this morning, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may see our God, we may view our Saviour, and we may love and praise you more. Accept of our worship and our adoration and answer our prayers in accordance with your most perfect will and for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, we most earnestly pray. Amen. Now we'll call upon Tim to bring the children's talk. Good morning, kids. Nice to have you with us. Nice to have you with us for the first time in a long while, Jacob. I can't see you at the moment, but I'm sure you're back there. And I have had some text through to say who's watching at home. Are oh, Lily looking very happy? Grace looking very happy. Lovely to see you with us. Elijah, nice to have you with us too. Apparently, Elijah likes watching me on the telly, so there we go. Autographs available at a later date, Elijah. Well, we're going to be looking at Saul again. And today, we're going to be thinking about how Saul disobeys God. Now, disobeying means breaking God's rules. And so today's story is about breaking God's rules. Now, to start us off, what is a rule that you wish you could break? I asked this to the kids. It was a dangerous one, but thankfully it wasn't too, too dangerous. Emily. Emily would like a sleepover with her friends. She can't do it at the moment. It's very sad, isn't it? But lots of people would like to have a sleepover with their friends. Lucy. It took a while for me to understand this, but she wants to be able to go to a different playground at school so she can play with other children that she doesn't get to play with. She only gets to play in your bubble, is that right? Joshy would like to be able to go to the zoo, be able to see the lions. Judith would like to never eat vegetables. Grace, on a very similar theme, would like to eat sweets every day. And she'd like to go to her cousin's house to play with them. Ben, Ben Duncalf, Ben would like to never have to listen to his parents so he could play on the Wii whenever he wants. I'm not sure that's the right Wii. That looks like a pretty old school Wii, but I don't know. Depends what you've got. Tim would like to see people again and have them round at our house. That's lovely, isn't it? And Jacob, with a tearjerker at the end, Jacob would like to not have to stay two metres apart and go to Nanny and Grandad's and give them the biggest hug ever. Aw, Jacob. Well, there's lots of rules there, and lots of rules that are really sad, and we don't want to have to keep. But sometimes God's rules as well, or our mummy and daddy's rules. Yeah, don't get too excited about going to the zoo, Joshy. <laughs> and you'd like to see the Ancola cow. Very nice. But sometimes... We don't even want to keep God's rules. We don't think that they're the best rules. And that was the way for Saul. Now, you're going to feel a bit sorry for Saul when we tell you this story. Because Saul was getting ready for a battle against the Philistines. But it started to go a bit badly. And his soldiers were afraid. And as a good king, he was thinking, how can I make sure... Here he is, the man himself, Jacob. Lovely to see you, Jacob. 
that Saul was worried because his soldiers were really scared about going to fight. You can understand that, can't you? They were feeling scared. They were starting to hide in caves, hide in grass, hide everywhere. And Saul thought, what can I do to cheer them up? Well, Saul believed in God, didn't he? So he thought, well, what we need to do is we need to do a sacrifice to God. We need to show God that we want him on our sides. But there was a problem. It was Samuel who was meant to do the sacrifices. And Saul wasn't supposed to. Well, Saul waited day one. Samuel didn't come. Day two. Day three. Day four. Day five. Day six. Day seven. And Samuel had said he'd be there in seven days. So Saul thought, what am I going to do? The Philistines could come at any moment. So next slide. Saul made a sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel. Now that sounded like a good idea because sacrifices were something God liked. But God had said that only Samuel could do the sacrifice. So it says on this picture that Samuel was angry that Saul had disobeyed God, and that was true. But more importantly, God wasn't impressed. Now Saul tried to explain, he said, well, you don't realise, Samuel, that we were waiting for you and the Philistines were going to attack. And I just thought it would be a good idea. And it's always like that. It always seems a good idea when we break our mummy and daddy's rules or God's rules. But no, Saul had done the wrong thing. King Saul was sorry for his mistakes. But Samuel told him a new king would be chosen. In fact, he told him something very, very sad. He said to Saul, your family would have reigned forever if you'd have kept this command. But now someone else will be king. That would be his family. That was going to be David. We'll find out about him after Easter. Well, what do we need to learn? Guys at home, I've got my phone ready so you can answer. True or false, these ones. Okay. Do you know what true or false means? True means it's real. False means it's wrong. If you're here... If you think it's true, put your thumbs up. If you think it's false, put your thumbs down. Okay. True or false? Saul was right to disobey God's rules. True or false? False. Yeah. Sometimes it seems a good idea to break God's rules, but it isn't. What about this one? We should obey God's rules too. Is that true or false? True. We should obey God's rules. And you know what? Sometimes God's rules don't seem like they're the best idea. But they always are. And we've got a false there. That's from grace. Well done. That was for the last one. What about this one? Jesus is the best king because he never broke God's rules. Is that true or false? Well done, Arthur. That's true. And that means that Jesus was the best king. Saul was okay for a while, but then he made a lot of mistakes. We've got Jesus who always keeps the right rules. What about this last one? Grace, you've got it right again. Well done. I'm sorry you're a little bit behind. If we break God's rules, we should ask Jesus to forgive us. Is that true or is that false? Should we ask Jesus to forgive us if we break God's rules? True. Well done, Ewan. True. Well done, Arthur. I can't see Jacob at the back. I can see Tim's thumb. Well done. True. We're all going to break God's rules sometimes. We should try not to, but we are. And we should ask Jesus for help. Well, thanks for listening, boys and girls. I'm sorry, there's lots of rules that are sad. And one of the rules that is very sad is we can't go and chat to each other after the service. But thank you for listening really, really well. Thank you very much, Tim. One of the rules is that we put our masks on, and I often forget it, but we, we, we'll try, we'll try. One or two notices, to, one or two things to bring to your, your attention. Uh, you'll have received a bulletin electronically, I trust, and uh, to do spend time looking at uh, what's taking place and the life of, of, of the church, but just to highlight one or two things. 
Um, in a moment, Tim will be uh, back behind the lectern and he will be bringing God's word to us in a, in a little while. And at six o'clock this evening, we'll join with our friends uh, from Grace Church Sandbach on Zoom, uh, and Paul will be speaking this evening. Now, Grace Church has resumed their services in Sandbach as of today. I think that's right, and uh, we're, we're very glad of that, and I'm sure they'll be delighted to be uh, together, as we are this morning, uh, physically together in the worship of God. Then on Tuesday, by uh, way of Zoom, we'll be having our small groups at 8 o'clock. Uh, do join in if you possibly can. And then on Thursday at 8 o'clock, there's a ladies in lockdown evening, uh, details in the bulletin. And on Friday, uh, the children's um, uh, meetings earlier on, and then the young people a little later on Friday night. Many are struggling with health issues of various kinds, and others are seeking to offer care to folks uh, and support at home. Um, we remember Janet Wisner from Grace Church. She's in Leighton Hospital, has been for most of this week, the well, last week, and uh, the hope is that she'll be returning home in the next few days after tests and, uh, and the like. Natalie, of course, is in the later stages of, uh, of her, her pregnancy, and we trust that that will go smoothly. I think it was last week we were shocked to, and greatly saddened to learn from Helen Brumby that on the 9th of March, her sister's husband, Ollie, was tragically killed in a road traffic accident when walking near his home. He leaves behind a wife, Jill, and three young children. Must remember them in our prayers. As our brothers and sisters at Grace Church grow increasingly towards independence, there has been the need for our joint eldership in consultation with the deacons to consider strengthening the provision of church offices at Sandbach. After 40 years of very selfless uh, service, Bob Baxter will be stepping down from the eldership in the autumn, and it is proposed that John Sauberts be elected to serve as an elder, and Colin Graham and Chris Close as deacons. These proposals were put to a meeting of members at Grace Church Sandbach on Wednesday last, when in a secret ballot, uh, it overwhelming, overwhelmingly indicated support for that proposal. The nominations will now be put to the membership of both churches at our AGM on the 25th of May. Now let's come before the Lord in prayer once again. Let's pray together. We thank you, our Father, that because our Savior cares, we can confidently come to present all that concerns us, all that perplexes and troubles us, all that highlights our need and our dependence upon you. Enable us to lay our burdens down at the feet of one who constantly proves to be altogether sufficient to meet our every need, whatever it might be. We thank you for the reminder from your word that you are the sovereign God over all that takes place in our lives. We give you thanks for the continued evidence of progress to overcome this awful pandemic which has affected us all and indeed throughout the world. Help us to endure. And we pray that you will bring about the progress that will allow all those in power to lift the restrictions so we can interact freely together 
and worship as we would. Grant us godly patience. Give us a humble submission as these graces particularly do not naturally fall to us. We pray for all who are suffering and struggling with the demands of life. We pray for all those who are ill and infirm and for their carers whose devotion often goes unseen and unrewarded. Strengthen them. Give them grace, O oh Lord, we pray. We especially remember our sister Janet in hospital and others undergoing treatment. Our hearts go out to Helen Bromby's sister Jill and her three young children, shockingly having a husband and a father suddenly taken in this tragic accident. Be merciful, Lord, we pray, and pour in every necessary grace comfort and consolation for both them and the wider family. May these rare incidents cause us to soberly reflect upon not only the horrors, but also upon the brevity of life and where we personally stand before you, the living God. May we be prepared to enter your presence should you suddenly take us. We thank you for our families and we pray for your support as we seek to live out our Christian testimony within our homes and amongst those who know us best. May our conduct be a confirmation of our profession of faith and demonstrate an increasing likeness to Jesus Christ. Children are a great blessing from you, O Lord, for whom we give you thanks. And we ask that you will uphold Natalie in these latter stages of pregnancy, a joy and anticipation, and grant her a safe birth. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the whole household of faith, for placing us within the family of the church. And we particularly thank you for our local partnership with Grace Church Sandbach and the way you have led them forward and have graciously provided for them. We thank you for the unity expressed in the nominations of church officers, for those willing to serve, and we ask that our two fellowships might recognize your clear leading and direction. We pray this morning for Tim as he brings your word to us in a moment, undertake for him in every respect. And similarly, we pray for Paul this morning and this evening in our gathering together, especially be with our friends at Sandbach as they resume their services together. May it be a true joy and delight for them. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Answer them in accordance with your sovereign will and for your glory's sake. Have mercy upon us, and in the name of Jesus, hear our cries, and do not pass us by. Amen. Now Dave is going to bring us the reading from God's Word this morning, Matthew chapter 20, and after he has read, Tim will come and uh, bring to us God's message. Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. 
Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. Thanks, Dave. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, do keep those uh, Bibles open. We'll be coming back to them uh, in a second. Lovely again to see more of you back. Uh, maybe as vaccines come or maybe as you start to feel a bit more comfortable about coming out, it's lovely to have you with us. Uh, lovely to have some of you visiting for the first time as well. I feel really gutted that you could be visiting for the first time when people can't come and say hello uh, but we love having you with us, and we hope you'll start to feel more welcome, even though it's a really weird situation. Well, I wonder, have you ever been to A&E in the hospital? I know some of the kids have. I know some of the grown-ups have too. Yep. <laughs> Tim's putting his thumb up. It's not very thumbs up when you have to go, is it? But you have been. It's a, a horrible place to be. Sadly, we've been more than we probably should have in our lives. It's packed full of people having the worst day of their lives. There's usually someone who's in real pain, wailing constantly. Someone else who's visibly wounded. And there's usually a child, often it's ours, cuddled into their concerned parent. And you just look around the room and you just see a tapestry of human suffering. But the worst time, the worst thing is when you go to the nurse and she gives you the expected waiting time. It can sometimes be hours you're sat there before you can see a doctor. In fact, they try to encourage you not to go to A&E. Call 111, see your GP, talk to a pharmacist. A&E should be the last resort because it's a long, long wait. And the big message is don't come unless you have to. Now, some of you may feel that that's the way it is with Jesus Do not come to Jesus unless you absolutely have to. Jesus has more important things to do than see to someone like you. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like an outsider. You don't usually attend church. Or if you do, you're not one of those people who serves and gets involved. Or maybe you are one of those people, but you just feel constantly like a failure. Jesus must have more important people than you, you think. But here's the thing. If you go to A&E and you have an urgent case, well, they'll never turn you away. In fact, they'll do everything you can to rush you to the front of the queue. I remember once when we went with with Lucy, when she was little, you won't remember this, sweetheart, but uh, we went in. And they looked at Lucy's stats, and when they realised how bad it was, we were out of A&E in a second. They'd found us a bed, then they found us a consultant, and it was nearly the case that they'd found us uh, a helicopter to go to another hospital. When you're in need, you go right to the front of the queue. And what this passage shows us is that if you come to Jesus this morning, you will be rushed right to the front of the queue. He doesn't want to discourage you and put you off coming to him. He wants to encourage you. This passage shows us two blind men who moved to the front of the queue, who found answers from Jesus. And the way Jesus treats them should show you how Jesus will treat you if you come to him this morning. Well, there's three things, three encouragements we see in the short passage. The first is this. Come to Jesus broken. These are clearly broken men, aren't they? Uh, As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. Why were they sitting in the road? Well, they're beggars. If you were blind in those days, you didn't have uh, sight-friendly jobs. There were no guide dogs, no braille. In fact... Many people believe that if you were blind, you were cursed by God. 
So they would have been cast out in the streets. The odd person may have flicked them a penny, but if you've ever been to Manchester and walked past people who are homeless, the vast majority of people will walk straight on by. That was these men's lives. They, when they heard Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. What was the response of the crowd? Well, the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. It wasn't just that they were particularly noisy, like someone like me has to put up with all the time, but more likely, they believed these men were cursed, and therefore they believed they didn't deserve to come to Jesus. With all this clamour for Jesus, with all these people wanting to see him, surely the two blind men should be at the back of the queue. But they're persistent. They keep on shouting, shouting even louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, there's a couple of Greek words for mercy. I don't want to get too technical, but this one basically means take pity on us. Feel sorry for us. The average person walks by them every day and feels no pity, doesn't feel sorry for them at all. They ask Jesus for pity. What will his response be? Well, verse 32, Jesus stopped. That's significant. Jesus stopped. He's got places to go. He's got people to see. He's got a crowd of people around him. But when he hears these men cry, have mercy on me, he stops. And even more, Matthew tells us in verse 34, what was going on in Jesus' heart. Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus had compassion on them. Many of us think of Jesus as some sort of emotionless being. We're so used to him uh, in our stories that we forget that he had feelings. He was a real, genuine human being. And when he saw these men, knowing what they'd gone through, he felt deep compassion. And that shouldn't surprise us. The word compassion is used very frequently to describe Jesus. And he shows that compassion elsewhere too. He says earlier, as we read a few months ago, come to me all who are needy. He loves the needy. He says that the poor in spirit are blessed in his, his first recorded sermon in this book. If he turns any away, it's the self-righteous Pharisees. It's not those in need. Just like an A&E department doesn't want healthy people to turn up. Jesus doesn't want those who are righteous. He wants those who are broken. That's an important message for you and I. Because just as much as Jesus welcomes these blind men, he welcomes you this morning, no matter how far away you feel. You may feel that you are being pushed away from Jesus by the crowd. People like you don't belong with him. Well, this passage tells us the opposite. It tells us we should confidently ask Jesus for pity and expect he will give it. Don't stand on the outside. Don't assume that Jesus would never have you. I cry out for mercy. And if you do that, this passage tells you he will have compassion. The book of Hebrews, which we studied not long ago, puts it like this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It wasn't just the blind men who God promised to give mercy to. It was us who come to him as well. So come to Jesus needy. Secondly, come to Jesus in faith. 
We've been uh, reading this passage at, at home with our kids just to kind of get them used to it, so hopefully they'll be able to understand a bit more. And we've been practicing shouting out time and time again, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. It's a very clear statement, isn't it? Well, let's think, though, what this statement shows. In other accounts of this miracle that Jesus gives, it, it, that, um, sorry, in the Bible, about Jesus, it tells us that later he praises these blind men, for their faith. But it's even clear in this statement. Faith needs to believe some things about Jesus. It can't just be some general feeling that God is good. It's got to be faith in some specific things about Jesus. And we see them here. He's called Lord, which could just mean sir, master. It could be a respectful thing that a beggar might say. But it goes even further. Son of David. Remember what we said in the kids' talk about Saul. Saul was replaced with David, and David was told that someone in his line would rule forever. Some of the promises about that Messiah, Peter shared with us at the start, that he would open the eyes of the blind, that he would unstop the the ears of the deaf, that he would bring about this perfect world. When they call Jesus the son of David, they're saying, we think it's you, not anyone else. We're sure that you are the one that's going to bring these amazing blessings. It's not that it could be this person, it could be that person. No, it's you, Jesus. It's you alone. It's not good enough for us to have some general faith that there's a God out there and that he kind of loves us. That's a good start. And we could see that in the world, but we've got to have something more. We've got to know who we're calling on to help us. It's a bit like if you call up 999, The first question they'll ask you is, what service do you require? If you have a fire, it's no good calling calling an ambulance. And similarly, if you want salvation, if you want mercy, it's no good calling to a a non-specific God up there. You need to call on Jesus, the son of David, the promised one. Only with him can you receive mercy. But faith is more than just knowing those facts. It's a vital first step that they know Jesus is the son of David. But you've also got to believe that those facts apply to you. These men didn't just say, you're the son of David. As we see next week, a lot of people said. They said, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. During the week, there's been that big hoo-ha, hasn't there, about one of the vaccines and whether it's safe or not. And earlier in the week, someone asked the Prime Minister what he would do to increase faith in the vaccine. And what did he say? Well, he said, I'm going to be having my vaccine this week, and that's the one that I'm going to have. Now, why was that a significant response? Well, because he wasn't just saying, I believe this will work for everyone in the country, but I'll take the other one. He was saying... I believe it will work for me. And that's what we need with faith. We need to not just believe the facts about Jesus. We need to believe them for ourselves. Now, both of those things are important. Some of you here this morning, you don't really know who Jesus is. You need some more information. Is he the son of David? Isn't he the son of David? If you're in that situation, I'd encourage you to to keep coming, to keep listening, to read your Bible, to ask questions of a friend or a a Christian. Uh, Maybe join us for a Christianity Explored course when one happens. Find out enough that you know who you're putting your faith in. But there are some of you here this morning, uh, perhaps particularly the children and young people who've grown up in our church, you know all this stuff. You know loads of truths about God. You know that Jesus was the Messiah, that he died for sins and all of that stuff. You could tell all the stories. If you weren't too nervous, you could probably say a lot of the things I say at the front each Sunday. You're clever. But you haven't taken it as your own. You've said he's the son of David, but you haven't said to him, have mercy on me. He's not just the Lord, he's my Lord. 
He's not just the son of David. He's my son of David. He's not just going to have mercy on lots of people out there. He has mercy on me. Don't let everyone else in this crowd this morning come and receive from Jesus and you not. No, Jesus is here for you. He will stop for you. He will say to you, what do you want me to do for you? Don't pass this opportunity. Cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. And don't stop shouting it until he responds. And he will. Because you know there's no one who's ever come to Jesus for mercy and has been turned away. There is no one, no matter how evil, who will come to him, who will be turned away. So this morning, cry out, whether you're at home or here, have mercy on me. But then what does Jesus' mercy do? What does Jesus come to do? Well, come to Jesus for sight. Verse 32, Jesus stopped and called them, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, they answered, we want our sight. When they came to Jesus, I can imagine it's a a little bit of a a nervous situation. It's funny that um, Becky said about Elijah liking to watch me on the telly. It's really funny when we meet up because Elijah has this kind of weird look like, I see you on the telly, you're not a, a normal human being. And when you meet a famous person like me, of course, <laughs> you can get a bit nervous. But there's no um and ah in from them, is there? They know their problem. Lord, we want our sight. That's a clear request, but it's a massive request. We haven't even got a cure for blindness today, do we? Even worse then. In fact, it was considered the most impossible thing uh, to cure, except for death. I wonder what you would ask for if Jesus came this morning and said, what do you want me to do for you? And maybe you'd want all of this coronavirus stuff to go away. Maybe you've got a medical condition and you'd say, please take it away. Maybe you've got a struggle emotionally or in your family and you say, please, Lord, take this away. But there's something deeper than that going on in this passage. An important question here is, Does this promise that kind of healing to happen today? Well, I remember when Lucy was a bit younger and there was uh, an eye doctor who came round, checked all the babies in the ward. And one week they came and checked her eyes and they said, oh dear, it's not looking great. Uh, It looks like the eyes aren't going to develop properly. There may be a bit of of, uh, a visual impairment going on. Uh, we'll come and check that in two weeks' time. Are we worried about it? We prayed about it. Two weeks' time, the doctor told the nurse that she'd given him the wrong child because that whole thing had gone. Now, I think that was an answer to prayer. But at the same time, I've got to acknowledge that it is nowhere near as dramatic as what we see in this passage. Uh, These men were stone-cold blind. Not developing badly but blind now an atheist could argue that it was just lucy's development it was something unusual and they they could be right god can use the development of a child but no one if they saw a blind man able to see could argue with that there's something quite dramatic about what jesus does here Is it because we lack faith that we don't see blind people being able to see? Is it because we're particularly sinful and we're not able to see things? No. These events happened around Jesus and by Jesus because it was showing us that Jesus was bringing this amazing new creation which Peter shared for us at the beginning when the blind would be able to see and the lame would be able to walk. Yes, there are answers to prayer, but there's nothing as dramatic as what Jesus brings here. Because Jesus is pointing to something much deeper than blindness being cured. Much deeper uh, than deaf people being able to hear. Sometimes one medical problem trumps another. 
If you have cancer and a cold, nobody's bothered about that runny nose anymore. In the same way, even physical blindness is nothing compared to the deepest blindness we have. In Matthew's Gospel, time and time again, we'll we'll go over some more passages on Tuesday, but time and time again, blindness is related to spiritual blindness. Let me give you an example. Just after giving the parable of the sower, Jesus says, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. We, by nature, do not see with our spiritual eyes. We are blind, we are deaf, we are ignorant. We don't understand Jesus. But Jesus is able to cure that. I I know some people who... They've read the Gospels and they feel like they understand it. They even feel like it may be true, but, but they admit that they're, they're just lacking that, that one more thing. They, they just don't seem to be able to get it. And it feels that way when our eyes haven't been opened. But Jesus says here through this miracle, I'm able to heal that. I'm able to take away that spiritual blindness so that you can see. So you can see who I am. You can see what you need me for. So if Jesus says to you, what do you want me to do for you? Your response should be, I want to see. I want to see, first of all, how I've broken your commands. I want to see how much I need you as my saviour can be a hard thing to see it can be a horrible thing to see but it's a necessary first step because if you don't know the disease why would you look for the cure we need to see that and then we need to see jesus Uh, paul talks about uh, when he went to see the galatians that jesus was portrayed as crucified like they saw it even though they didn't and that's what we need We need to be able to see that that Jesus is the true God, that he did die on the cross, that he did pay the price for our sins, that he did rise from the dead, and that he will give eternal life to all who believe in him. That's the greatest gift Jesus can give to you. As good as it would be to have that illness taken away from you, well, you get ill again, wouldn't you? As good as it would be to have that problem sorted out, another problem would pop up. No, we need something that will solve all the problems in our world. That will take sin totally away. That will give an eternal life, joy and bliss forever. Where there will be no suffering. Where there will be no doubt, no uncertainty, no fallout, no conflict, no war. Nothing evil at all. And the only thing... The only one who can bring that is Jesus. Jesus has something better to offer you than what you're asking for. He brings to offer you healing for your sins. A cure for your spiritual blindness. Forgiveness with God. So when he asks, what do you want me to do for you? Ask for the right thing. Ask that he would give you spiritual sight so that you can trust in him. Jesus, as it were, has stopped in the street this morning, stopped in this room, and he speaks to each one of us now. What do you want me to do for you? It's an amazing question when you think about it. Not what are you going to do for me, but what do you want me to do for you? What is stopping you from asking him to save you? Maybe you think you're broken, too broken. Well, come to Jesus broken. As he welcomed those outcast, blind beggars, he will welcome you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, no matter what you've said, no matter what anyone else thinks about it, 
Sinners are his speciality. Matthew was one of the worst, and he got to write a book in the Bible. He wants the broken. Don't let that stop you. Maybe you know the facts, but you've never accepted them as your own. Well, come to Jesus in faith. Don't just come to him as the saviour. Come to him as your saviour. Cry out to him, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I may not feel like that mercy has come right away, but don't let that stop you. These men weren't heard right away, and maybe that's an example for how sometimes it feels to us. Cry out to God, have mercy on me. Don't let him go until he gives you that eternal life. Maybe you're asking for the wrong things. Maybe in your mind's eye, the most important thing right now is some tragedy. And I don't say tragedy lightly. Many of us in this room are experiencing real tragedies right now. And inevitably, that's what we bring first and foremost. But actually, there's a greater tragedy than any of us are walking right now. There's a tragedy of the punishment we deserve for our sin. The tragedy that people made in the image of God could be given God's wrath for all eternity. It's a tragedy because it's so easy to cure. So when Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Come to him for sight. There's nothing in this passage to block off anyone in this room. Jesus is here through his word, speaking to each one of us. Will you let him walk on by? Or will you cry at the top of your voice? Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. We're going to spend a few moments in quiet. And then we're going to stand and we're going to to think (laughs) amazing grace. So let's just spend a few moments in quiet and then the song will play. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's stand together.
Father God, I thank you that as we look around this room, we see so many examples of your ability to open the eyes of the blind. We thank you that those who have been beggars on the roadside, spiritually speaking, you have responded to their calls to have mercy. You've opened their eyes that they may see enough to cry out to you. And we thank you for that. But Father, as much as we thank you for opening eyes, we pray that you would open more. Father God, only you can bring it. Only you can open those eyes. We ask that you do so. We ask that even this morning there would be those first cries of faith in you. And Lord, at what we pray for those in this room, for those at home, we pray for our village. So many will perhaps hear the, the vague story of Jesus over the Easter period and will not come to him. Father, we know that we can do what we can to preach that message, but only you can bring the growth. Lord, open more eyes, we pray. In the midst of the crowds about us, see those blind men. Have compassion on them and cause them to cry up to you. We ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.